So we're live and uh, hello everyone. I can see we've still got people joining us, but I, I think we'll start. I'm Nicola Solomon. I'm the Chief Executive of the Society of Authors and thank you for joining the eighth in our afternoon tea series running until mid-July. All our sessions are free, but if you can afford to donate a few pounds to the Authors Emergency Fund to help authors who are suffering the effects of the COVID crisis, please do. Um, the link's in the chat so you can get it there. We're very lucky to have as our guest this week, Sarah Waters. Today's format, as per all of them, is a quick intro from me. And then Sarah and I are going to chat for about 30 minutes and then have time for audience questions for about 15 minutes. If you've got questions, if you can put them in the chat, if you can mark them with the red marker, it's probably easier for me to pick them up. Um, and um, so um, all I wanted to say about, also we want to thank, uh, Sarah Waters has been one of the judges of our Paul Torday Prize and we wanted to um, to thank Paul Torday and Nicholas Allen and all the people who, and ARCS and all the people who give money to our prizes. And next week at this time, we'll be celebrating our awards. So that'll be another big day for everyone else to come in and look about. But just turning to Sarah herself, Sarah Waters OBE has written six novels, including Tipping the Velvet, The Night Watch and The Paying Guests. Shortlisted for the Booker Plow Prize, the Orange Prize, the Bailey Women's Prize, uh, Women's Prize Fiction, her novel Affinity was awarded the Somerset Mourn Prize, which is Society Authors Award, and the Sunday Times Young Writer of the Year Award. She served on the management committee from 2009 to 2012. So she was on the management committee when I first started the SOA and been hugely supportive to me. And um, I'm really looking forward to being with her today. Sarah, can you start by giving us a short tour of your workspace, as much of it as you feel comfortable sharing, <laughs> and your creative routine? Yes, I will. I should say hello first. It's very nice to be here. Um, yes, it's funny. When you first asked me to do this a few a couple of months ago, I was quite squeamish, wasn't I, about the idea of, I suppose, letting, letting a camera into my um, study. And in a way, I couldn't quite account for. Well, I, mean, I sort of can account for it. You know, it's very much my space. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of sitting at my desk with my desktop computer. So I, it's not very mobile. So in fact, I, I can show you a bit of the room, but I won't show you the whole thing. Um, I mean, basically it's, I live in a, in a sort of tall, thin Georgian house. And this is, this room is right at the top. Um, it's not an original room. It was added on, but it was done very nicely. So it's very tall, very airy. There are two skylights here, two windows over there. It's the of the whole, uh, footprint of the house as um, estate agents say so I have a sort of a view of kind of houses over there with the gas works in the background which I like um, but it's it's not a, it's not a room you would an area you would pass through you know so I sh I mean my cat comes wandering up from time to time <laughs> but even my partner Lucy doesn't tend to come up here that much we meet downstairs you know when I go down to the loo or for a cup of tea or for meals obviously so I, yeah I do feel quite um protective of this space i realized really um anyway so this as i say here i am at my desk um there was oh gosh here are some oh blimey i don't show those sort of plans and things for the book i'm working on at the moment there's a whole there's a section of books here that's sort of lots of queer books here including some lovely vintage things like this lovely well of lovely. Oh, well of men, yes. <laughs> I went to her grave at Highgate Cemetery. <laughs> it'd be normal, yes. Um, so that's, that, that, they sort of really belong to the first bit of my career in a way, I suppose, or it's what sort of what, what got me writing, you know, that my, my passion for, for queer history, lesbian and gay history. Um, down here there are sort of London books, so there's not books this is a glorious book that has been very useful for the book i'm writing now which is set in the 1950s it's just lovely street photographs from the east end by nigel henderson and i've got sort of bomb damage maps that was very useful for when i was writing the night watch which is set in the second world war i've got you know the a to z of victorian london oh, wow. which was one of the first books when i was writing Tip in the Velvet, I came across that and I was so excited to buy it. You know, it was it was a really big moment for me, I suppose. Kind of, in, I had no money. Yeah. I was sort of investing in a hardback book that I knew would 
give me this glorious insight into Victorian London um, was a, was was great. So that's a book that I that I still feel very fond of. Um, and then going, oh, this makes me look like a complete narcissist. But these books here are my foreign editions, and I keep them there because they're just so they cheer me up, you know. And they're they're so great. There's some fabulous ones like. This is my Russian fingersmith, for example, which is just glorious. I think. Oh my goodness, that's amazing! <laughs> I know. And then there's be you know beautiful, beautiful ones like this Czech um, tipping the velvet, which has just got all this glorious artwork inside it. So that's sort of yes, that's the extent of my books. Really, I've got a few more up there. That in the corner is frankly a wardrobe. I mean, I I could call it a cupboard, but it's you know. It, it's a wardrobe. So this this room is used sort of for a bit of crap, really, to be honest at times. That's a big hoop um, because, <laughs> like many authors, I've ended up with awful back pains over the, you know, from sitting at a desk for so long. So I went through a phase of kind of, oh, my God, doing hula hoop at the end of the day. Can you imagine? Um, <laughs> Does it so work? There's odd bits like that. There's a Pilates roller over there. Um, and then, you know, all of the rest of the room is is you know other people's books honest you know not just mine um so over there there are there are a lot of shelves that are research for my for my various books so there's a shelf of books about the 40s which was you know obviously useful for the night watch and for the little stranger there's a section on poltergeists and things like that which was brilliant research for the little stranger um and then over there is sort of all my fiction, sort of all the way up the wall, or all, just all my fiction shelves. So books that I've, some books I've carried around with me. Well, some from childhood. I've got a whole load of Doctor Who books up on that top shelf, which were my first sort of, it was my first reading passion, really, Doctor Who books. Um, and then I've got books that I've carried around with me since, you know, the, the books that I read at school, some Jane Austen, some George Orwell, that I took to university with me and have taken with me through every move I've made since, you know, through every house I've lived in and books that I've added to, you know, added to the, um, yeah, so that's the room. And then desk, shall I talk a bit about my desk? Yes, do. Um, I've got, um, oh, I, was, I watched Philip Pullman's um, one of these. I was very jealous of his book stand because I've just got a sort of, this is my book stand, which obviously isn't, <laughs> doesn't really work very well. So papers just sort of sprawl all over that. That's the, that's what I'm, that's the the way I work is to I write on the screen, I compose onto the screen, but in order to edit it, in order to judge it, I have to see it on paper. So I'll work on the screen, then I print it up and it ends up then I read it through, which is the best moment really, and mark it up with change the changes that have to be made. And then I plop it here in front of me and work on it. And then we'll print it up, you know, print it up again and again. That that sort of I mean, this is a chunk of about ten thousand words that I've been working on. Do you write the whole thing before you get to that mm. printing stage, or do you? No, do no, not at all, not at all. In fact, even this book, I've been working on it for several years, and I still don't have a complete draft, you know, from start to finish, which is a bit unusual because I usually, by this point, I do. But this book has just been a very, a bit of a different writing process. Do you want to talk a bit about this book and what you're working on? Yeah, it's a book set in the early fifties. Um, um, it's not gay. It's um, sort of a family drama, really. It gets a bit gothic, so it's more of a one of it's my gothic side, really, like The Little Stranger. Um, and it's been an interesting process. It's sort of been a slightly different process. I started. I I always I like to start with a plan. Again, thinking back to Philip Pullman, I know he was saying he doesn't like plans. That once he did a plan, and then he was bored to death of it, and so he didn't do any. He sort of lost lost enthusiasm for the book but I need a plan really and in fact this book got was slow to get going because I kind of thought I had a story but all I really had was a sort of a scenario really a sort of a mood um so it took me a long time to figure out wh where the story was you know um and in a way no I was going to say I'm still doing that I'm, I'm past that point now so um the plan planning came in a bit later than usual really so it's taken a bit longer but yes, it's a, a writing diary thing. I do. I do. So that's the first. I don't have any sort of writing rituals exactly, but I'm slightly ritualistic about the way the day is structured, I suppose. So I come up here for about 8.30 in the morning if I can. Um, and, you know, I'll open up. The first document I open up on the screen is my writing 
diary, which to be honest is, 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 is mainly a record of what I've achieved each day. In and, terms of like literally number of words. Well, yes, it's that you always used to be traditionally. I would count up the number of words I'd written that day, which obviously only works when you're when you're composing. You know that doesn't account for like planning days or revising days, which is actually the bulk of writing. You know, rewriting is the bulk of writing, really. Cool. Um, so I found myself actually more recently no, making a note of the sort of the time I clock on and the time I clock off. I, why do I do this? Because no, you know, what, what possible interest is it going to be to me in 15 years time, you know, I don't know. But I think it's something about the psychology of working on your own. Um, you, you know, when you're an author, you don't have colleagues around you. You don't have a line manager. You know, you don't have an HR department. And you, you are completely on your own. So I think there's something about, for me, it's something about validating my working day. I and also, do you think that, I, I speak to so many successful authors who have a kind of guilt about being successful authors and all the people you speak to seem to think it's quite, easy so so somehow validating for yourself that it's real work might be also helpful in some way maybe although i think i you know i think i got to the point of knowing this was real work quite quite a long time ago um it's it's just some purely something more about making just sort of um not about it's it's about just commemorating that day's work i suppose you know so i'll i'll open up my writing diary put today's date put the time i'm clocking on and then at the end of the day, I'll note the time I'm clocking off, which is usually about, I mean, if I can work till four, I'm, I'm pleased. But you, usually, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a bit slower as I get older. So I start at 8.30. By 2.33, I'm beginning to flag. But if I can keep going to sort of four, that I'm oh, doing. I'm sorry to have made you work beyond your, <laughs> your, your hours for the day. No, it's just the sort of, it's just writing. That's the thing. I can do other bits of work at the end of the day. And I'll often do reading at the end of the day, sort of till six, which is when I think. I'm entitled to clock, you know, to stop, stop work. I can read and, and think that's fine. It's something about the writing. I usually, I think I peak about half 11 really in the morning and then, yeah. So, um, so yes, how I'll... do you find your, your subject? So is it something that you, you talked about a mood, you have several books because I know you, you famously write quite slowly. Do you have several books in your head at one point or do you somehow have a, this one and then you do the research for it and then you start writing how does the whole yeah, thing yeah very much it's real sort of serial monogamy you know I just I can't right writing takes so much of my you know writing one book takes so much of my energy really and time that I couldn't I couldn't do another book on the side I just I mean I couldn't have an affair for the same reason I mean it <laughs> does would take too much too much sort of work and um and energy really um, so no, I'm very faithful to the book I'm working on, but there usually comes a point, and actually it's very nice that I've sort of reached that with this book, which I'm hoping to finish. I, I don't think I'll finish it by the end of this year, but I'm hoping to finish it within, you know, the next year and a half. Um, and I'm already thinking about the next book now, which is a nice thing because it's sort of there on the horizon. Mm. Um, and I've, that's pretty much always happened. Maybe it didn't quite happen with this book, and that's why it was a slower start. I had to really think about what I had to find you know where to go next rather than having already found it by the time I started and have I, you ever abandoned anything halfway through or is it you're quite firm no, on it I haven't you know I really believe I mean there have been with all my books there have well most of them there have been sticky points big you know sometimes quite big ones and certainly with this book you know I I've been working on this book for nearly four years and there have been some interruptions with one thing and another but there were for the first couple of years you know I could tell I wasn't finding that I wasn't finding the story and there were times when I thought oh fuck you know maybe I should just just abandon this but I, I believe really that you you can find the story there is a story there there's always there are always stories and it's just a question of it might not be where you you might have to look you know not where you thought you did at the start and you might have to clear away a load of stuff but I, 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 I do believe you can find the story if you just stick at it long enough, assuming you want to. I mean, the worst thing that can happen is you get bored with an idea, mm. obviously. And you've moved from Victorian times through, you know, Second World War and so on and into the 50s. Would you ever write something set in the present time? Yeah, actually, I never used to think I would because I'm so motivated by the past and how we write about the past and think about the past and reinvent the past. And the, diff you know, the strangeness of the past is what's really been my engine as a writer i've really enjoyed that but actually i would i think and again it would the sort of gothic i'd quite like to have a go with a modern story with a gothic 
something gothic going on. So that might be what I'll try next. There's um, some fairly gothic elements to this being locked in. I was thinking when I was rereading Affinity and there's and the kind of the sense of locked often, often your books create this huge sort of quite closed environment. And I wondered if the how the pandemic has meant and this this locked in thing to you and and whether it ties in with some of your themes. Yes, the book I'm writing now is very much another sort of closed community, you know, very claustrophobic. I like a claustrophobic narrative. You know, I'm a big Highsmith fan, for example, or a Hitchcock fan. I, I, it's just, it really appeals to me. And I like interiority. So somebody like Daph Daphne du Maurier, you know, <laughs> she's she's brilliant at sort of female interiority. Men men as well, actually. But, you know, think of Rebecca. You're just in this head, in, in this world. It's great. So, lo I mean, lockdown just... It kind of suits me. I feel really guilty saying this. And I've been incredibly lucky with lockdown. You know, I've got my house. I've got, we've got a garden at the back. Lucy and I are both very used to being at home together. Um, and of course, being a writer, you're kind of, that's kind of lockdown life all the time, really. Um, I'm lucky that I didn't have um, an, a, a new book out this year. I think it's been really mm. tough for people who've been, you know, were just getting ready to sort of launch a new book. Although I know it, you can be creative about, about that. But I, that, so for me, this was always going to be a writing year. Um, so lockdown really hasn't, if anything, it's been. Um, I presume you've done much of your research as well. So yeah, like I've done all that. That's all way behind me now. So this was, yeah, this is purely a writing year. So, so lockdown is, has been very helpful, actually, because you know, there's nothing so helpful for a writer as a rather dull life. You know, very even days, very, very even, unremarkable days. And um as I say, in, in lockdown, if you've if you've been lucky, if you haven't been touched by the by the pandemic physically and none of your loved ones have, and if you've got, you know, if, if you've got the sort of job you can do at home, then I think lots of people have enjoyed the sort of slowness, you know, haven't they, of lockdown life. And I've still been able to do, I mean, my one thing that I love doing is going for a walk, which I usually yeah. do at the end of a writing day, and sort of go out with the book in my head and, um, you know, mulling over what I've been doing and, and often have some of my best ideas when I'm walking but I just you know I just love walking for its own sake and walking around the sh just local streets in London South London so I've been able to carry on doing that you know and in fact I was just going to say sorry and London was actually so fascinating especially in the early days of mm. so silent and the streets were so quiet you know both in terms of traffic and people and the, the people who were on the streets were sort of slightly anxious looking figures who were sort of half enjoying it like I was half like oh I can't get too close to you you know it's very odd I mean for me inevitably it made me think of the the, the you know London in in the war and the, the peculiar spell that the blitz would have cast over the war I mean it's you can you know you can't take that comparison too far obviously but, but it's it, that sense of the streets not being quite safe actually which fits in with some of your Victorian but not 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 threatened yeah. but also a bit unusually unusual I guess unusual you know I didn't feel the streets were unsafe in fact what struck me was how nice everybody was to each other you know and that we that you know that lovely thing you did when you were walking towards somebody and you would slightly sort of grimace as you you know it's nothing personal you know um, I've just got to get out of your way and I just thought that was absolutely lovely um so if anything I thought that that um that 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 it had a a real sort of charm to it you know again i have to qualify this by saying how lucky i know that, that lockdown has been trauma you know has been traumatic for many people um, i'm going to pick up on something you said before um that will may or may not come as a surprise to some people you say that your the right the book you're writing now has no queer characters and you've got rather known as you said for writing books about gay and lesbian subjects um do you think people will be surprised do you think people will be disappointed do you um it, to my mind you're that's not what you know that is one thing your books about you're also very interesting class in houses and lots of other areas in in the gothic but but how do you think people will feel about that I don't know. I mean, yeah. it was, <laughs> I know that some of my lesbian readers were disappointed with the paying guest. Uh, sorry, with a little stranger. Um, you know, the boring straight one. I've seen it called on Twitter. <laughs> it's a bit harsh because actually I love the little stranger in a funny sort of way. I feel like the little stranger is the closest book to, to me, really. Um, 
So I kind of think, oh God, you know, there was a little bit of that, but I, I don't know. I mean, having done The Little Stranger, I've sort of established my gothic credentials, I think. So I'm hoping that that will allow me to do this next one, which <laughs> which is all about class and houses, actually. Um, so, yeah, so there we go. You can only write the book that calls to you to be written, you know, so that's what I'm doing. Well, there's a great question here, which says there seems to be a plunger on the scene behind you. On the floor. <laughs> Is that your cure for writer's block? <laughs> <laughs> this isn't a plunger. It's, uh, it's an Ikea lamp. Oh, how disappointing yeah. for everybody. There was all sorts of speculations going on for all sorts of people, and now it turns out it wasn't a plunger. At all. <laughs> but I'm actually going to go to that shelf behind you about all the translations of your work. Oh, yeah. Do you work closely with translators? Do you get asked questions about the book? How do you feel about the translations of your work? I mean, you have to just take, take it on trust. I mean, I've got like schoolgirl French, do you know what I mean? So that's that's not going to get me anywhere. That's the most I've got language wise. So uh, you just have to you just have to believe they're going to do a decent job. And in terms of contact with translators, I think more often than not, I don't have any contact. But some translators in particular have initiated um conversations with me my french russian spanish um and a maybe a couple of others and that's been really interesting and it's mainly been about just asking me to clarify points um you know so i mean now 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 there's the internet of course when i started the, the internet wasn't really the, the resource it is today so with my last book for example the paying guest there's a reference some some poor woman's got very swollen ankles and francis the narrator uh, this protagonist says, although they're kind of, they look like the kind of feet you keep umbrellas in, meaning those awful uh, elephants. I know, yeah. You know, so I think my Spanish translator or somebody wrote and said, I don't know what you mean here. And of course, I was able to just call up an image and say, this is what I mean. And he was like, aha, I see. So it's become a lot easier with things like that. And I you're mean, the, Sorry, go on. I was going to say they have such a, a strong sense of of place, but they're often very, very grand in those areas. I mean, you really see the streets of London. So... Or, or the particular words that are used or the vernacular. So actually the translation must be quite tough for translators in some ways. Yes, I think especially those Victorian ones where I use a lot of slang, obviously, you know, pose a challenge. And I know that some some translators have found, uh, you know, just found equivalents in one way and another. Um, obviously that's what they've all had to do really. So. Lust, I mean, my Spanish translation of Tipping the Velvet is called Lustra de la Perla, excuse my <laughs> accent, which is apparently, you know, a rather saucy euphemism, sort of polishing, polishing the pearl. <laughs> so, of course, it's it's not the same as Tipping the Velvet, but it's in the same, yeah. you know, same kind of thing. So it's great when they can find something like that, but obviously they can't always. So in, in French, it's caress caress the velour or something which always makes me think of a set some of the settees we had when i was <laughs> <quite cool>. <laughs> <laughs> did you um I, I the people are talking in the chat about the handmaid which i also just watched the, the south korean adaptation and how did you feel about that and other adaptations of the, your work because that's rather fascinating that for kind of the first half it's very faithful and also has that that very strong particular property that they walk around and talk which also kind of feels like your work and then it goes off somewhere else entirely so I'm really interested to know what you felt about that. Um, I loved that film I thought it was great I mean I've been lucky with all my adaptations but that was very special I think because it was it did this brilliant thing of being very really faithful to the story I mean it does do its own thing in the end but that's fine because it remains faithful to the spirit yeah. of the story Absolutely. but I mean for the bulk of it like two-thirds three-quarters of it it's incredibly faithful to the story. Of same sort of language and everything yeah yes and yet you know it moves it to kind of this completely different period completely different setting um with with slightly different dynamics obviously um uh, yeah so it's 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 faithful to the book but it's this wonderful work of art you know in its own right which is what you get I think I suppose when you when you have a real um uh, you know a, a director uh like Park Chan Wook who's who's an auteur I suppose you know who has who has this really strong creative vision of his own but I mean and I mean it was incredibly flattering you know it was the same with um The Little Stranger which was adapted a couple of years ago um by Lenny Abrahamson who's doing who's just done normal people for telly you know and I mean again it was you know it's just so it's so flattering to think of these very talented people 
yeah, you know, seeing something in your book that they want to use as a springboard to create their own something of their own out of it. And do those things make you see different things in your work that you didn't see before, or do you feel that they're pulling out something that you really wanted to see? I think I think I felt with both of those that they were just finding slightly different ways to to get at the heart of the book. So, for example, with the Little Stranger, Lenny's film of that, you know, he, the end of it. Is in the in the novel, you know, it's kind of interior. It's in the doctor's head. It's a, and he finds a way to to do it that's 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 not at all in the book, and yet it's perfect. You know, it's perfect psycho, in terms of the psychology of, mm. of the, the narrator. It's just brilliant. So it was a really, it was just it was almost my favourite moment of the film. It was the it was the moment that was in a way furthest from the uh, you know literally furthest from the from the action in the book, and yet it was so perfect. I felt at the end there that I, I loved it. Mm. And were you closely involved with those things, or do you just leave them to it? I am not creatively involved. Uh, uh, that's not my, you know, I don't see that as my job. And frankly, to be honest, by the time a book of mine is being adapted, I've already moved on, you know, maybe by a couple of books. So, oh, yes, you've got, you're married, you've got a new partner by exactly, then. Exactly, yes. So I don't really want to go back, and because I'm absorbed in another project, and I never really like revisiting my books as books. It always makes me feel a bit squeamish. So... It's far better for me, you know, that somebody else is doing it. But of course, I I love being um, included in the process. So they've always been very generous, you know, my adapters in term, both in terms of the crew and the director and the actors and the scriptwriter, you know, about showing me drafts of the script, for example, and then inviting me on on set to see what's happening. And I just find it I find it fascinating. Um, the you know, I mean, to me, it always seems like novels are novels and films. I think re realist novels and realist films are very very close I think I think a novel is much more like a film than it's like a short story actually or a play novels and films they share a, a sort of um they use the same sort of tools you know close-ups and long shots and montages and cuts and it's all the same sort of stuff really so I find it fascinating what how much a novel can just very smoothly translate to the screen and and the thing you know what can't what can't stay and why. I remember Len I did an event with Lenny and we were talking about the house because The Little Stranger is set in this great big hall called Hundreds Hall. And he was saying, you know, as a novelist, you have you have the luxury of not having to describe everything. But of course, with a camera, it all has to be there. Um, you have to like, you know, fill every room. And that was an interesting thought. So I just- You do have a fantastic way of creating a whole sense of space and a visual image of the properties you're working with, often houses, as we were talking about. Hmm. I'm going to have to move on a bit just because I think we want to get to some of the brilliant questions that we've got. And um, I promised we'd talk a bit about judging the Paul Dorday Prize and how that's been for you. Now, I promised everyone that you weren't going to tell us who the winner is, but you can talk about the shortlist and also about the process and also about what prizes mean to you a bit, perhaps, as well. Yeah, no, I loved judging. I love judging prizes generally. It's always great to get this. It always gives you this really interesting slice of contemporary writing, for one thing. And obviously, at the Paul Day Prize, it's by, you know, first novel, first novels written by somebody over 60. So it's a very particular kind of demographic. And I think, actually, probably, um, I sort of, I think I sort of expected the age of the writers to sort of show in the fiction, and it, and it really didn't at all in, in any sort of obvious way. But, you know, the novels felt very alive and contemporary. Sorry, I'm not far off my 60 myself, so, I, you know, I'm not being terribly Just turned out this year, my favorite. Well, I can apply. <laughs> <laughs> but what really, what did strike me was that the, the best of the novels, by which I'm, I suppose I mean the weightiest of the novels, which are the ones really that have ended up on the shortlist, there, there was this really common common thread of um, sort of trauma and recovery and reparation, you know, how we do, you know, trauma in terms of personal trauma, community trauma or national trauma or international traumas like war, you know, how, and injustice. And of course, these are really, you know, these are the issues of our time, aren't they? You know, people, we've all been living in structures of, you know, very unequal, very in, unjust structures. Our societies are kind of founded on them. You know, how do we... How do we cope with those? How do we make reparation to people who, as a group of people who've been, uh, you know, lived, um, you know, been sort of prejudiced against? And yeah, so I was very struck by that. And I think that is kind of something that comes to you with age. I mean, certainly, you know, as I've got older as a novelist, I've got much more interested. When I think back to my early novels, where I really had fun with sort of Victorian villains, you know, there were villains and there were, there were heroes or heroines mainly. Um, 
and since you know in my more recent book i've become much more interested in moral muddle really and in grayness rather than sort of black and whiteness and you know how do we get through difficult things and maybe we can't sometimes get through them what does that mean you know all that sorts of things so i think that what, what i'm saying is i think that that was an area where the the sort of weight of life experience that that the writers had did sort of show really with those Paul Torday novels. And we do have a lot of moral muddle at the moment, um, both with the, with the um, Black Lives Matter and with many, many things about the equal effects of the pandemic as well. Oh, absolutely. Do you think that those will, uh, will affect and come into your work later on in one way or another? I think, I think with this book I'm working on, it's sort of, you know, it's kind of a book about that sort of post-war optimism, but what was underneath that and who was left behind? What did it mean if you didn't share that post-war optimism, if you sort of... So it's very, it's kind of, it's kind of, since the little, since The Paying Guests, really, which was very, very much about, um, for me, you know, it was very much about how do we de deal with these big forces, these big injustices um, that might manifest themselves on a sort of small level, you know, how do we negotiate yeah. them? So I think um, it's kind of what I'm interested in at the moment anyway, really. Yes, because there is that, the whole thing, the paying guess about what happens when someone is guilty for a crime that, you know, or is found guilty for a crime that you know they didn't do yeah. on some level. And those, yes. but at what I mean, point does your safety, yes. you know, outweigh, the, at what point does their safety outweigh yours, you know? It's and of course, that, that's very much of, of our time now. And do you think that will affect books that, get written and and indeed um that the industry will publishing industry will change in any way um i think it has been i think it has been one of the big one of the big um uh features of of the the pandemic in the uk isn't it the way the inequality of its impact on people depending on how many you know what your resources are um how you know how, how much you're exposed to it um and of course you know it's that classic thing that the people who've been valued the least in terms of, you know, occupation so far are the very people who've been a keeping the rest of us healthy, but also, you know, mo most at risk really of contracting. Yeah. So I think that has really impressed people. I hope it really, really, really has impressed people and will um, remain there, you know, as we move forward. Um, I hope so. Going back to, I mean, yes, I completely agree with you, and it's something we all need to work to continue. I think one of the things that um, one of the areas that have been very much affected is bookshops, and hopefully they're going to be opening from I think next week. Have you been supporting your local bookshops in any way recently? I'm assuming that you are still reading, and if so, what as well? Yes, I have been reading. Um, I, I might. I have a heroic postman round here because I get a lot of books sent to me, either books that I've ordered online, that like secondhand books, or books that are sent to me by publishers. And so my my our postmen are really, you know, are always having to bring me these books. And what happened was with with the virus, our local depots just seemed to kind of seize up. So I managed to get a few things in just as lockdown started that I'd ordered. Um, and then for weeks and weeks, nothing would, would arrive from Royal Mail, which I completely understand. So I had to be a bit more inventive, you know. So I, I, I was reading um, e-books, for example. Um, um, I've just finished, um, oh, Girl, Woman, Other, Bernadine. Oh, Abbott, fantastic. Yes. Which I very much enjoyed. And I had been sent some proof. I mean, I'm always, I always feel like a terrible failure with proofs because I get sent proofs of forthcoming books by publishers quite a lot. And I often, I just, I'm feeling, I've got so much reading of my own that I know, you know, I don't get to them. But because I've had this sort of slightly clearer space in lockdown, I've read a few of those. So I've read a couple of good ones. There's a Kate Summerskill study of, um, of, a, of a poltergeist case, actually, from the 1930s called The Haunting of Alma Fielding. That's out in October. And I've just read that and that's been great. And, and of course, on the tour day, you had to read his e-books this time, whereas normally we'd have probably sent physical books. No, I got them. I oh, you got them. It's a bit them. earlier, yes. It was earlier, yes. Um, there's another proof I've read of a of a of a of a French Senegalese writer called David Diop called At Night All Blood Is Black, which is about Senegalese soldiers and the First World War, which is like a kind of amazing sort of beautiful nightmare of a novel. It's extraordinary, which is again coming out in October. So I've been reading things like that. And then I've been read doing my own research reading, you know, which is sort of work reading. It's not it's not usually my bedtime reading. 
So thing, actually, things marvelous things like this. <laughs> oh, fabulous! Woman's Own from 1955, which I've been reading cover to cover. Um, which I managed to get some of those from eBay before lockdown started. Right. So that's been wonderful. Um, but yeah, no, I'm I'm longing to get back into an actual physical bookshop. Um, yes, definitely. I'm sure all of us. Um, I'm going to ask you one last question before I turn to the questions from others. Just you're a council member of the site, authors, you've been on the management committee, you do huge amounts. First, you've got something coming up in the next author. You did a short piece for us on, you know, the way on life stories. So what is being, what does the Society of Authors mean to you? It's just, I mean, it's, I've seen you ask other, other authors this, you know, and we all say the same thing. It's just that sense of community, I think. You know, writing is such a peculiar job. You're, you're on your own so much. Um, you get your money in odd ways. I remember that being a real, real think, thing I really had to get used to when I'd given up sort of paid work where I was getting a salary every month. Suddenly, the months and months would go by and I wouldn't get any money at all and then I'd get a chunk and then, you know. So there's, there are oddnesses about it. There's the, the whole there's the whole contrast between being solitary when you're writing and then having to be, you know, a public figure out in the world on stage, which is very odd. So it's great to be part of an organisation that understands all that. Um, the... Um, the magazine, I, I remember when I first joined the Society of Authors, I got the magazine and, and thought, what is, there's nothing, there's nothing in here for me. And then like within a couple of years, I'd open it and everything, you know, every, every article was absolutely riveting because suddenly it all made sense. Oh, look out for the next edition, everyone. It's fantastic. So full of wonderful things. <laughs> we haven't got it yet. We've just sent it to, to press, but uh, right. probably within the next month or so, it should be hitting your desk. And I mean, I, I like the fact that the Society of Authors is a, is a campaigning organisation, you know, and it's been, I mean, with Nicola, with you at the helm, it's been, you know, I think it's even that it's it's been even more so, you know, it's really found its campaigning identity and it's it's a union, really. And I love that about it. No, we're very proud of that. And I um, hope we do some good and do and being able to do some support. I'm going to turn to some of the questions we've had in no particular order. Katie Darby asks, have you ever considered writing an original screenplay or stage play? Have you ever had any ideas which aren't novel shaped? And somebody else also asked if you ever write short stories. So that probably fits in. I've, I've never been drawn to writing short stories. I think, um, you know, a great short story is a wonderful thing, but it's so different from writing a novel. It's really hard and it just doesn't appeal to me. I think if I had an idea for fiction, I would want it to, to extend it into a novel. So, so not short stories, not poetry. Screenplays, yes, I'd, I'd like to have a go in a parallel universe. You know, yeah. I'm so sort of, if I could clone myself and set my, set my other self to work writing a screenplay, I'd really enjoy that as a sort of intellectual exercise because I think it really is an interesting way of telling a story. Theatre, a traditional play, Again, I mean, it's you have to have a different kind of brain, I think, to be able to visualise the the, the the effect you're going to have on stage. What you know from what you're when you're writing the words on the page. I did do a few years ago, a couple before I started this book. Um, I co-wrote a sort of it's more, it was more of a show than a play, <laughs> which was hilarious with Christopher Green called The Frozen Screen, which was an absolute hoot. I loved it, and it was a bit it was a bit it was a bit untidy. Though I think if we were doing it now, we would do it slightly differently but that was that was my only brush with writing for actors and it was yeah it was it was lots of fun but I wouldn't you know I wouldn't um have a go at being a serious playwright that would be that would be daunting um I've, I've been asked quite a lot of questions about how you write but I'll start with this one from Patricia Adams Wright how much time do you spend on your opening chapter when compared to the other chapters is it much longer um it's it not no actually and funnily enough i'll often come back come back to it right at the end i think opening chapters sometimes you can only see what should be in them when you've written the rest of the book you know certainly when you've got to the end of the book um so with several of my novels especially the, the, the sort of opening scene i've i've written like last of all and with this book i'm writing now i've just recently embarked on a rewrite but i haven't gone right back to the beginning i've gone up to about fifteen thousand words in knowing what roughly what will be in the first 15,000 words but I want to I want to get to the end and then go back you know because so much of writing is you know it's like a piece of architecture it doesn't really matter I mean I do like to work through a novel broadly from the beginning um but I go back and forth so much you know it's re it really becomes meaningless where it is in the in the in the sequence of of the storytelling yeah um and here's one that's, that I know for many authors. Anna Mazzola says, how do you manage to separate the creative side from the business side of writing? 
do you manage to shut it all out when you're writing? Well, so it's funny when you go after four o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> There's, I mean, it's to me, it feels like there's three parts to being a professional writer. And one is the writing and one is the sort of what you might call the perform or the publicity side to it, which involves a certain amount of performing. But then there's like admin, which in which I would include the sort of business side of it. I don't know if that's what you mean, but um, and that is completely different. That's like any small business person. You know, that's about accounts and emails and, and things like that. And that, you know, I mean, that for, obviously for me, the main thing is the writing, except when I've got a new book out and I'm, I just devote myself to kind of prom promotion, I suppose. Um, so really and truly those admin things tend to get done at weekends. Um, so it's it's finding that balance. But again, I remember having to find that, you know, when I first began to be successful as an author and like, oh, right. OK, yes, this is this is how it works. And, and you have to you have to find your way of handling that, I think. And do you have a trusted reader, someone who you get, you get feedback from as you produce the work or do you only share the work once it's finished? And if so, who do you share it with? Is it just your editor or are there other people? Yeah, no, I've got writer friends who don't share their work with anybody until it's finished. And I think, oh, my God, how can you do that? Because for me, you know, I'm writing for a reader. I want to know if I was if I was like make, you know, if I was like building a bicycle, I would want as I was building it to give it to somebody to try it out and tell me, oh, no, the saddle's too you know, thin or the wheels are too big or, you know what I mean? So uh, that's how I see it. I'm very sort of technical about a book that, you know, I, I want to know that my reader is f feeling what I've been trying to get them to feel at the right point. So my first reader is always my partner, Lucy, who is the, my also my toughest reader. But she's a very, very good reader. So she'll read s stuff when it's really, really unformed. Um, I've got a friend, Sally OJ, who's now a, an independent editor. Um, who is also a great reader of my books and incredibly helpful. And then really, I, it's my agent, Judith, who um, she, she's very good at giving a more of a sort of overview of a, of a book, really, rather than a close reading. And then and then it's my editor. And off, with the last few books, I've had a couple of editors because I've had one here, one in the US and then one in Canada, which has been a bit, a bit mind boggling at times, having three editors. So two is about OK. Um, but at Lenny is my main editor, you know, Lenny Goodings at Virago. She's yes. she's been my editor for years now and I, I know her and trust her. And so, but I mean, by the time it's got to Lenny, it has to be pretty, really, it has to be, um, well, not finished, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I've sort of run out of steam with it and I need, I need a new eye on it. Um, but it needs to be fairly polished by the time I send it to Lenny. But, but um, Lucy will see it you know, when it's dreadful, really. <laughs> <laughs> good. I'm sure it's never dreadful, but uh, yes, good for Lucy. I'm. Um, oh, here's a good question for Goodheart. All the names making comments are female. Do you know what the gender split is between your readership? Um, I don't. I mean, we know that we know that it's women who tend to read fiction, isn't it? Um, it's that classic thing of women read books by women and men, and men tend to read yes. books by men. But I'm always actually very, very, very surprised and heartened by how many men I hear from, how many men come to events when I do an event and how many men feel really quite passionate about about my book sometimes. You know, that's that's really nice. I like that. So, I, you know, it's mainly women, but that's because it's mainly women who go to book groups and go to festivals and, and all that sort of thing. I don't. So I don't know more precisely than that. There's a. Um, lots of conversation going on about the postcard behind you, but I think they've decided it's Daphne du Maurier. It's is that... Daphne du Maurier, yeah. And um, and then there are a number of questions about hula hoops, including an offer to start a hula hoop club, and somebody <laughs> saying that you need the heavier weight one, and that would be more effective. Oh no, it is. It is. I have to say, it is weighted. It is a proper gym hula hoop. Uh, it's actually quite painful on the ribs when you're really going for it. So um, thank you for that. But yes, I, I should get back to it, actually. Well, actually, if you remember, before this started, we were talking about the fact that I've got a pole dancing pole in the area which belongs to my daughter. So uh, I could ask you to give us some hula hooping, but probably we'll save that for another day. Just this was promised to be afternoon tea, not an afternoon hula hoop exercise. And there's just one more question that i'm going to ask because that's all we've got time for which is a huge shame because this has been so much fun which someone's asking lots of people about asking about research you do research in archives and how do you do the research beforehand if you haven't got a really good sense of where it's all going 
I know, that's the thing. I always think, really, you need to do the research twice. You know, the first time you don't know what you're looking for, so you have to read very generally. And so I usually start by reading general books. So I knew this, you know, I was drawn to the early 50s. So I read David Kiniston, you know, and Rachel Cook, yeah. great book about women in the 50s, and begin with books like that. And then I kind of very quickly you realise, I find, the general area, you know, you can sort of home in on them. But, yes, it's not, an, it's not for months and months that you know you can be more t really targeted about it. And then, as I say, really, you need to go back and reread David Kiniston because you would see. So I tend to take a lot of notes when I first start and um, oh, way more notes than I'll ever need, you know, but just so that I can survey the notes at a later date and then be reminded, oh, yes, you know, now I've got a scene in the cinema or something and there was a great thing about cinemas in the 50s or you know, that sort of thing. But, yeah, it's hard. So I do way more research than I ever need. But you just have to do that because, you know, you've got to, what's the word? You've got to speculate to accumulate. You know, you've, you've got to sort of just cast your net very wide. And most of what you draw back, you won't need. But you'll find those things that just set, set something off and, and make you um, make things sort of coalesce around the ideas you've already got. And then, and then so you know, flesh it out just to mix my metaphors. But, yeah. And I wasn't going to ask a final question, but this is such a good final question that I'm going to ask it. Do you ever have difficulty or doubts deciding on which ending to use? Actually, while on endings. No, I find my beginnings much, much harder than endings. I've usually got well, a sign of the book being alive for me is when I know what's what I'm what's going to happen right at the end. Often I almost have the final scene. I've certainly I've had that with this book for ages. And I'm looking forward to getting there, you know. And then it's the, I think I'm, uh, and I quite like my, the endings of my books, but I think often my, my beginnings are a bit flabby. So I'm trying to avoid that this time around. So no, I don't, I've never really had sort of alternate endings at all. I've just known, I've always known exactly what, where I want to land. Well, that's a really good end. Plus, unless, was, are there any other ending comments you want to give, having spoken to everyone being so generous and frank and thoughtful and perceptive as you always are? And and having now very openly shared your workspace when you weren't sure about the beginning. So is there something that you want to add before I finish off? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> it's been very yeah. nice. It's been, thank you very much. Thank you. It's thank been you. fun. It's okay. quite hard to believe there really are other people watching me except you, but I'll take your word for it. No, so. we had that. We were going to show up. Oh, you've got to show up on your mug and I promised I would show up on my mm -hmm. mug. So I'll, you can, I'll start with my mug because it's best that you end. My mug is a tribute to Margaret Thatcher, <laughs> which is very impressive and says on it, um, Britain's first lady prime minister and is in sort of on the end has some really tasteful sepia with a nice bright red <laughs> union jack. A real oh period piece. Lucy uh, put this made for a joke. For me. I think I said but, to, to uh, Sarah, not many people who have a mug that says the world's greatest novelist can <laughs> have a real claim to prove it's true. So that's great. <laughs> Um, and you know, thank you just for us for being for talking to us on behalf of myself, on behalf of all the authors today, on behalf of the judging you do, on the support you give the Society of Authors and to everybody. And thank you to everyone who's listened in. Um, I'm going to eject Sarah and give you our final notices if I can do this. It's very exciting. I can throw you out of the room, I think, or maybe I can't actually. So maybe You're going to do that now, are you? Well, you can just sit here because I can't actually work out how to do that. that would be a good <laughs> thing. Can't pretend I'm really good at this. Um, so you can sit here for a minute. But just to remind everybody that all sessions are free, but if you could afford to donate a few pounds to the Authors Emergency Fund, which we really need because we've already given out the full £800,000 we've had, and it's been extremely important for people uh, to over 600 authors who've really, really needed it. That would be great if you could give some money to our fund. Don't forget to join us at the same time le next week when we've got tea with Cressida Cow. Also, uh, you can book that at societyofauthors.org.events and also all the events around our awards, which are fantastic. You can also buy the shortlisted books from all our SOA awards from Blackwells, and we're putting a link up for that. And um, and those and those all and so if you buy from those links, you'll also be donating to the contingency fund. Um, I'm going to and just sort of final thanks to um, everyone. We can we can continue the conversation on Twitter. There's a festival hashtag which is SOA at home. And I know that some of you are meeting each other for tea 
beforehand and you know just thank you for everything and for being with us thank you i'm going to screen share the final thing if i can do this so thank you to everybody and um and we hope you've really enjoyed it today thank you everyone thanks nicola <laughs>